to kick off anyway. So it's fine. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Michaela Leopold, and I'm the event coordinator for the South for DCS Perma. Um, we're very lucky tonight. We're going to have uh, Keith Wood talking all about internet um, things and threats and responses, and it's, the presentation is really, really interesting. So, I'm looking forward to that. Um, just a few things I need to go through for you. Um, first, if you've not been here before, in the event of fire, um, do follow uh, the BCS member of staff for staff who will lead out of the building um, that way. And we don't have Siobhan here tonight, do we? She normally reminds me where we congregate on the street outside. Um, but BCS member of staff will that way. Um, toilets are out that way, turn left and right at the end, so there's a favourite for you. Um, if you find it gets too hot or too cold, you can change the air conditioning, so please let us know. We have had it a little bit too cold in previous sessions. Um, the recording um, that's going on there, and I'm standing wrong place again, sorry, um, will be available to you within a week of tonight. Um, it's available on the Panopto channel along with all our previous presentations that we've made to the board as well. Um, the slides will also go out available to you from the website, so you'll be able to have a look at all the excellent links and references there. Um, for those of you who are BCS members, um, we also have a LinkedIn group, and what we'd like to do is sort of try and build a community and share what we're learning from these sessions on those. There'll also be a feedback email that goes out to your office, and if you could please fill that in, that helps us to improve the programme going forward. Um, I know we've got a few non-members in the room tonight as well, so if you find the event useful and like what you hear and want to sort of help join the community, please do think about joining up. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Pete Woods, who uh, many of you are very familiar with. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. I don't mind. Hello. 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 Good evening. Good evening. They're all right now. That's good. Thank you very much for giving me your time this evening. I'll try and make it worthwhile. For those of you that have seen me before, I'm not my younger brother. I have cut my hair. Um, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, then it doesn't really matter. Um, I've been, see if I can make this work good. I have been an engineer since 1969. Actually, I was an engineer in my own mind when I was about seven years old and first blew myself across the room plugging something into a main socket that shouldn't have been plugged into a main socket. I then spent several years taking radio sets to pieces and not figuring out how to put them back together again. Um, eventually, that sort of take it to bits and see how it works mindset led me to where I am today, um, working in uh, what is euphemistically referred to as ethical hacking, but is really sort of simulating criminal attacks one way or another. So my heart is originally in electronics and electronics engineering. That's what I studied. That's what I've got some sort of qualification in. And that's why I was interested when people started talking about the Internet of Things, because that's where electronics and computing really meets, I think. During the 1980s, I spent a good portion of my working life on computer connected systems in laboratories, in manufacturing, measurement, and so on. So I've got, a, I think, a pretty good understanding of where the industrial automation side of IoT came from. And of course, like anybody who's nosy, I've started plugging in all kinds of different devices at home into a segregated network, of course, <laughs> to, to see how they behave and what the issues are. Um, so, this evening's presentation is split into a, a few different areas, and I'll, I'll cover what those are with you in a moment. I've, yeah, I've timed it so that there should be time for questions at the end, but if anything's really pressing, I'm not making myself clear or, or no clearer than usual anyway, or there's something you, you, you just can't hold in, please do feel free to interrupt. I'm not precious about that. If you go off on too long a tirade, everyone else will gang up on you and tell you to shut up. <laughs> but I won't because I'm terribly polite, as those of you know me know. Um, so, yeah, lots of engineering stuff and, and quite like IT and computers and networks. My first packet sniffing 
exercise on the network was in 1976 using some sort of weird 3270 protocols, I remember. So I've always liked what goes on down at the bottom. <laughs> now, this is what First Base does, and I'm not going to do an advert, so if you're interested, I'll explain it later. But basically, it's about breaking stuff or telling people how not to have stuff broken. And this is what we're going to cover this evening. So I've included the term IOE, Internet of Everything, just because the marketing people are making us think about IoT and IOE and Internet of Everything and Internet of Things and Internet of Heaven knows what. And it's worth just running a few definitions in front of you. In the end, really, the Internet is the Internet. And what we're talking about this evening is devices that are connected to it that aren't standard computers with a keyboard or mobile devices, I guess. So we're going to look a little bit at the threat actors, in other words, who the attackers might be in this space and why. And I've pulled some research off the web from some companies I know quite well. Um, you've probably heard of them, we'll get to that. I'm going to highlight some of the key security issues as a backdrop in my understanding of how operational technology and IoT stuff is vulnerable. I'm going to look at one example of consumer devices based on um, a piece of research we were sponsored to do a couple of years ago. So although it's two years old, I think you'll find it still holds relevance. Then we'll have a look at industrial systems and some of the issues that we've seen in industrial IoT environments. And uh, then I'll run through a few fun examples that you can um, look up on the web yourself. Some interesting YouTube videos of people breaking stuff when they shouldn't that might give you more perspective, more depth than I can cover in sort of 40, 45 minutes. And then a, a bit of formal Q&A at the end if you haven't asked all your questions along the way. Now there's no fixes in here on the slides, but there is opinion. That opinion will be Pete Wood's opinion as we walk through. So feel free to make notes, but as with everything in IT, my experience is that what's true this week might not be true next week. So we'll see. So let's start with what is IoT. And in Wikipedia's opinion, it's that, it's the internetworking of stuff. It can be vehicles, can be buildings, can be anything that's got embedded electronics in it. So IP cameras, temperature sensors, sensors inside mobile phones, it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. It is a marketing term because, well, we wouldn't be IT if we weren't continually adding words to the lexicon, would we? But IoT has become a thing. We did a little trend analysis on Google and uh, to look at the uptake of people querying Google for the term IoT, and it's the sort of curve you'd expect. And that uptick really started about two years ago when the press started talking about it. Mainstream press started talking about it enthusiastically. What is the Internet of Everything? Here we quote our friend Cisco. Um, for some reason, a chunk of my slides falling off the bottom here, which is slightly concerning. Um, I'm not sure why, but anyway, um, I'll read it to you off the paper. Um, probably because this was bigger than the font size you're using on here. I don't know. Anyway, um, what this slide says is that, that the IOE, as opposed to IOT, is about not just the devices, but how that affects people, processes, and data. And one of the biggest concerns that citizens have about IOT and the data collection that goes with it tends to be around privacy more than it does around security and confidentiality. And there are a lot of interesting issues um, particularly, you, you probably saw in the press a couple of years ago a, a story about um, certain brands of smart TVs that are voice activated. They would send that data back to the manufacturer unencrypted across the internet because why wouldn't you? <laughs> and they were having to listen to you talk to the telly so that the telly could learn what you were saying. And of course, therefore, in some cases, the imagination runs riot. That's what people might say in front of the television or indeed say to each other in front of the television. So there was some quite justifiable concern about privacy on that particular issue. But let's just have a little bit of a, a, a look at the history. Now, this is no 
in my view, no Irma presentation should be complete without an historical perspective. I mean, some of us are quite historical anyway, so, you know, it kind of makes us feel better. Um, certainly does me anyway, as I approach some sort of deadline and wishing to escape from working full time, which isn't happening. And that's Nikola Tesla. And although he was talking about radio communication when he said wireless, there's a really, really lovely commentary at the end of this statement, way back in an article that uh, was published in 1926. A man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket. Well, I no longer wear a vest, although a t-shirt is close. But I think that idea of being able to simply access all the information in the world through something in your pocket, envisioned as it was in 1926, and now, of course, a reality with a smartphone. Although how much you believe what you read in that huge repository is a different question. But in terms of Internet of Things data, it's just ginormous, as we'll see in a minute. Anybody here not know the history of the internet? Good, I thought so. A very informed audience, so I won't bore you with this slide. But for some audiences, I have to just put that into perspective. My point at the end of this slide is none of this is possible without a worldwide switch network, right? It has to be a packet switch network for this to work. And the fact that we put the TCP IP stack, however we define that, into everything means, of course, that everything can talk to everything. You remember when they started to come up with the novel idea of putting a TCP IP stack into a mid-range or mainframe system so it could talk to those funny PC things around the office? Well, those days are gone, right? Everything comes with a TCP IP stack in it. And whilst the sensor on the wall might not have a stack in it, it's probably got a simplistic almost serial or sometimes literally serial connection to a controller. Whatever that controller is, whether it's a hive system in your house supplied as mine was by British Gas with a sense of humour, or whether it's one of the competing systems, inside there there'll be a web stack. And that web stack will sit on top of TCP IP forwards. So how big is it going to get? Well, um, that said, today, I overwrote it with a splodge that says 2015 because that information is two years up to date. So in 2015, um, this originally came from, uh, uh, from Forrester, I think. They reckoned there were one and a half devices per person on the planet. Bearing in mind quite a few people on the planet have zero devices, that probably explains why certain people in this room probably have got more than one and a half devices in their pocket. And that by 2020, um, I have to keep reminding myself that it's only two and a half years away, right? There will be likely 50 billion devices, or eight per person. And that doesn't mean that you're carrying around eight devices, unless you're as geeky as me. But it does mean it's quite likely you've got a numerous uh, population of devices in your home, even if you don't know that you have, or you don't care that you have. So if you buy a TV now, it's going to be a smart TV. I, I, I'm quite a geek when it comes to watching home cinema and so on. So I, I did a little count up. So I've got a, a, a flat screen TV that's got an internet connection. I've got a receiver which does all the diddling about with DSP and so on. That's got an internet connection. That's fed from a DVD player that has, a Blu ray player that has, a Skybox that has, an Amazon Fire TV that has, and an Apple TV that has. So just in my lounge, I, I have to, because I don't like wireless very much for reasons that I won't go into now, they're wired, I actually have to have an eight port switch under me telly just so all these devices, you would, oh, thank you, Nick It's nice to see somebody nodding in a friendly way about my lunacy. So I've already got eight devices just in the lounge. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of people like that, right? And not all of them, and this is one of my tips that I'll keep bringing back, I'm sure. Not all of them will run that on a segregated network. Run it on a segregated network, please. If you have all this stuff and you don't really know what it's doing, it doesn't seem to me to be the wisest thought to run it on the same network as stuff that you care about, like your computer and the stuff you're doing on your computer, because attackers pivot from one device to another pretty readily. Thanks, please. Right, uh, threat actors. Only two years ago, the timeline of attacks against the Internet of Things was pretty sparse. There wasn't a lot of recorded information. 
about those sorts of attacks. Nowadays, the escalation is significant. Did you hear, I think it was last year, there was an orchestrated denial of service attack using unprotected internet connected cameras, IP cameras. And there's the apocryphal story about spam from a refrigerator, which you probably read. The press loves stuff like that. I don't care very much whether it's true or not, in the mainstream press anyway, but um, we've got some genuine stories about... Hmm? <laughs> Just stay cool, man. So there wasn't a great deal between 2000 and 2015, but there was enough things that you would care about. It back in 2000, if you were interested in the whole issue of operational technology, you know, the whole SCADA or whatever you want to call it, then there was the Australian sewage treatment plant that I've got a diagram of that I'll show you later that was, uh, that was hacked. <coughs> right through to um, the German steel mill in 2014, and the cyber espionage, energetic bear in 2012, and so on. So there were a few things in the press, but not enough to really capture the public's imagination. That is where I segue into a little piece about threat actors. I, I live my life in, in doing threat and risk analysis these days. It's not the most stimulating thing in the world, but working with clients to understand who the major threat actors are for their businesses does add value and allows us to design, in, in our world, testing regimen scenarios that attempt to reflect the most likely attacks against those businesses. So we've applied the same thinking to IoT. And, um, uh, a chum of mine over at Trend Micro shared this report. They've got some groovy little pictures, but the words underneath are in fact more important. So who's interested in attacking IoT devices is the question. And cyber criminals are because it's all about the money. Therefore, if there's some way to leverage the connectivity to Internet of Things in order to deliver some payout, then they will. The first ransomware on a smart TV has already been enacted last year. So that, you know, ransomware is a thing of the week, the month, the year, isn't it? In the first quarter of this year, the 70, no, 93% of spam emails, whatever that is, were carrying uh, ransomware. Ransomware is a service, in other words, just download the kit and use it using it as part of a, 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 a franchise operation by the criminal community is super popular because it's easy to do uh, and, and quite devastating for the recipient. So people do tend to pay ransom. So you see these things popping up on people's computers saying, your computer's been dot, pay this money in bitcoins, that sort of stuff. The first one of those for TVs has already been enacted. Why? Because they're running Android, and all the malware has already been developed for Android because it's such a popular Android, it's such a popular um, malware platform, of course. Not an Apple fanboy, honest. Malicious individuals is obvious, whether they're black hat security researchers or people who just want to prove how clever they are. Anybody you know who crosses the line between what I did as a kid, taking radios to pieces to see how they work and trying to build new things to plug into the mains power supply. They, these days, are more attracted to something that's online, of course, because that's where everybody now lives in the millennial generation, than messing about with this stuff. It's just fun to them. They may not even think about the consequences. Hacktivists, obviously. Again, denial of service, that sort of attack. It's very popular to get attention. So if you've got a particular beef with somebody, if you've got a particular agenda, being able to, as some people did, change a sign on a motorway in Germany so that it says something rude or carries your activist agenda message, or being able to knock something out and make things inconvenient for people, like the San Francisco transit system, for example, where you have to turn all the payment systems off because otherwise people can't travel because those have been blocked out. There's lots of things that malicious individuals can do in order to further their agenda and get attention. State actors, obviously, all of the nation states have these on their agenda. Look, probably the most famous of the IoT-style attacks was against the, uh, the centrifuges for the nuclear program. 
which, uh, which came out of malware written uh, allegedly by the Israelis and the Americans. That's Stuxnet. That was an absolutely classic IoT attack. And you, know, you must recognize that all nation states are investing a lot of money in building this sort of capability. Because if you're at war, what's better than being able to shut down the electric system or shut down the sewage system or, or shut down the transport system remotely? Minimum risk to human life, maximum impact on the enemy. So uh, you, you know, this is obvious. Terrorists, right now we're still seeing terrorists living primarily in the, in the real world, still getting effect through the sort of awful atrocities we've seen with human life. But it can't be long before the uh, ability to just acquire these skills via uh, uh, the criminal community for a price will enable terrorists to move into a, a cyber attack mode. And again, it's much more interesting for a terrorist to be able to attack the infrastructure of a country than it is to break into a bank account. Right? So there's a big impetus for that. And of course, companies. Because like I said earlier, people are concerned about privacy and the fact that many of these devices harvest in information en masse, unfiltered, suck it into a big data repository and it's perfectly possible to do sufficient analytics on that to profile somebody, their family, their environment from the collated data. And you know that's fine for the company if it wants to target you with advertising or it wants to do something specific to further its commercial agenda. But I think we have to have concerns about the privacy elements and how well GDPR legislation, for example, is going to be able to be applied to IoT, I think is an interesting challenge, considering how worried everybody is about conventional IT systems and compliance. So let's look at some of the key IoT security observations. And these are absolutely verbatim. There's, there's little to argue about this. The majority of Internet of Things things don't have security built in because they're cheap, because they're small. If you've got, you know, the engineers call that amount of space on the circuit board the real estate. And if that real estate is only large enough uh, to, to do what the device was intended to do, uh, to add encryption to that, to, for example, provide um, security of data in transit, means doubling the real estate, doubling the cost, and because the consumer doesn't think to even ask about that, and because there's very little in the way of drivers to have that happen, and because security's never built in from the get-go in anything I've ever seen. Remember when wireless was just wireless? And then they put in WEP, which lasted about a week before somebody cracked it. And you keep layering security on top of everything else. Remembering that TCP IP was never designed to be secure. It wasn't supposed to be secure. It was just for communication, right? You go back to half an hour. So all of these things are basically no security from the get-go. The endpoint devices I'm talking about. Where they do have security and big air quotes around that, it'll typically be in some sort of web interface in front of it. If you think about how an IP camera, when you connect to that, it, you know, the little barely intelligible instruction book will tell you to browse to such and such an IP address and it, you know, written in the manual it would say log in with the username admin and the password admin, that sort of stuff. Yeah. That's the convention. Those stacks, those web stacks on, the, on those front end devices are typically freeware, they're typically full of holes, they've never been patched, they've never been tested, they're, they're about as porous as the most porous thing you can think of. So that's not too secure either. Eventually, we'll get to the point where um, we think about message integrity and possibly secure communication. And then ultimately, we'll move the security closer to the object. And ultimately, it will get embedded. But we're still in the cowboy stage. We're still in the Wild West. These products, you know, there's millions of different standards. There's millions of different products. There's no harmonization. And that means that there's really no security standard at all. OK, this slide's really got to pieces. I've got a hard copy in. Oh, yeah, OK. 
So four key security issues, if I can read them, it says privacy, which I already mentioned, the massive data collection and distribution. And my advice, you won't do it. Read the privacy policies before you use the device. You're always doing that, right? You always read the agreement before you sign it, right? And before you use anything, you always study the manual front to back, don't we? That's why we invented the phrase RTFM. Secondly, insecure configuration. All of these, all of these devices, I would claim without exception, come with default passwords, insecure web interfaces like what I just said. They're usually HTTP, not HTTPS. The stack they're built on is full of holes, yada, yada. And insecure transport, no encryption for the data on the fly. So you know, it's just waiting to be hacked, really. Inherent trust between devices, that's absolutely the case if you look at the way any of the home networking stuff works, you know, to open and close your curtains and turn the light on, flush the loo or whatever it does for you. For mine, much more important, it turns the coffee machine on before I get out of bed in the morning. I find that very, very important. I know I could use a timer for it, but I just want to look at it on my iPhone. <laughs> so if one device is in some way compromised, because all devices inherently trust each other, that means that the attacker can automatically hop from device to device and compromise a whole network of them. And lastly, internet independent communication. So local comms between those devices is weird stuff like Bluetooth and Zigbee and Z-Wave and so on, which most people don't think about, don't understand how to, uh, to look at it even if they're staying inclined. So that isn't the end of the agenda. For some reason, the formatting's pushed off the bottom. Um, this is the consumer research we did on smartwatches. This was published 2015. So don't please say, but Pete, it's not like that, because it might not be anymore, but it was then. But some of the underlying issues surprised us, both positive and negative. So I'll briefly share them with you. So Trend Micro said, would we do it? And we said, yes, they didn't pay us to do it, but they invited us to do it, and they promoted the publication of it, so good for them. And they called it stress testing, we called it hacking, but basically we had a bunch of smartwatches that they gave us to experiment on. Sadly, we didn't get to keep the iWatch and the watch thing. They wanted to give it to somebody with uh, more needy than ours, they said, which I thought was unkind. But anyway, um, we looked at three critical areas in our view. The physical protection of the device, so what the access controls are like on the smartwatch, and any implications from those access controls. Looked at data connections, how it did its transfer between it and the smartphone. And we looked at information stored, in other words, what would be on that watch of interest to an attacker or to an opportunist thief who found your smartwatch lying in a locker in the gym. I believe there are things called gyms, don't they? I went to one once, I didn't like it. So we, the baseline was we took the watches out the box and tested them then and there. So the absolutely standard default configuration, bearing in mind that's how most people think, isn't it? If they're not techies, most people buy a product, use it, next. So out the box was important. No third party apps installed, which in some cases could strengthen the security, in some cases could weaken the security, depending on what the app is, but we wanted to take it as a baseline test. And we, we tried the watches with iPhone, uh, Motorola X, and a Nexus 5, because that's what they said they wanted. And this was July 2015, at that time, they were all running whatever the latest version of the, of the OS was at the time. So those are the watches that we tested. So um, some of these have survived the, uh, the test of time. Others may have disappeared in the commercial quagmire that is competition. But anyway, those are the ones we looked at. So you'll see the Motorola, the LG, the Sony, the Samsung, and the Asus all use Android, just like the smart TV does, just like the little plug-in jukebox that my father-in-law just bought, which is some sort of common way of getting old people to, to use some form of music delivery system. Apple was running Apple things, and Pebble was running the Pebble thing. Does Pebble still exist, anybody know? No. 
Uh, when you say this, you say good, probably. <laughs> okay, so then we, we looked at the, the level of protection that was available and how it was configured. So um, this is interesting, just working through the list, it doesn't matter which one's which really. But well, first question was, is it passcode protected by default? Kind of, I would have thought to a security audience, that's a, a fairly important question. You would hope, but not expect, right, that they would be protected by default. Well, the answer was the first one, Nitro, not by default, LG, not by default, Sony, not by default, Samsung, not by default, Asus, not by default, Apple, not by default, Apple, not available. A bit like a Apple Watch now, I suppose. <laughs> and what sort of authentication did it use? This is 2015, so all of the, uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, Come on, brain. It's too late in the day. I've been up since six o'clock. This is no good at all. Android, thank you. Watches use pattern recognition, squiggly, wiggly finger thing. And the Time Apple Watch used a four digit pin numbers only. That's been improved, although, how many people love to put a complex password into their Apple Watch? I think it's probably still using four digit pin by choice, but we'll see. What lockout was that? In other words, if you put the, when you set an access code on it and you got it wrong, when did it lock? None, 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 by default. That's good, isn't it? That's excellent. So you could try an infinite number of times. That means if you've got four digit pin, how many attempts you get? 10,000, isn't it? I, I got O level math, so I think that might be right. The good news was the data connections were solid. They were well done. So all the smartwatches used Bluetooth and they all used Bluetooth encryption, which at the time was solid. Um, the Apple Watch also has its proprietary identity services technology as an extra layer, which was good for them. Um, and where they used Wi-Fi, some of them did to keep the watch up to date when it was out of range of the phone. Then that was using TLS 1.2, which is a bit of a win, considering certain payment systems still aren't using TLS as far as I remember. What about the local data storage? This is where it gets fun because this is where we actually hit the sort of consumer where it hurts. What data is going to get lost if, for example, they leave this phone with no passcode set on it or an infinite number of tries to guess the four digit pin? What's going to get exposed? Um, the Motorola was unread notifications, historical fitness data, which in my case would just give doctors a heart attack, um, Google Keep entries, um, very similar for the LG, very similar for the Sony, very similar for the Samsung, very similar for the Asus. So in fact, this is just marketing really, and it's just sitting on Android. Right? Um, for the Apple, the list is so long, I can't read it all out, because of course, it's quite a powerful little device. It's got contacts, emails, calendars, pictures, blah, 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 blah. Um, amusingly, passbook at the time, which we tested with plane tickets and other interesting things. So that makes that a much more valuable resource to steal, you would think, right? Which we thought too. So in summary, physical device protection was, that this is the official report, it says poor, I call it rubbish, but it's the same thing. <coughs> only the Apple Watch had a lockout based on timeout and that was optional. It was also the only device at the time that allowed a wipe after a set number of failed logins, which is something I love. I love remote wipe stuff and auto wipe stuff because the <coughs> need for this is more important than the data. And of course, I've got six backups anyway, being me. Local data on all the smartwatches, which could be accessed through the watch interface itself when taken out of range of the smartphone it was paired with. And thus, if the watch was stolen, any data already synced to it would be accessible. So it's not accessing it from the phone, it's on the watch. All of the smartphones were using, as I said, Bluetooth and yada yada, so the data in transit was satisfactory. But here's a, an interesting thing about the Android based watches, and whether this is still true, but um, they can, the Android phone can use a smartwatch as an authentication tool, which means that the smartphone won't lock if it's connected to a trusted smartwatch. <coughs> unless you lock it. That means if you lose both items, the smartwatch becomes the key to the smartphone. And so you lock your smartphone normally, but no, you don't if you lose both devices. So we thought it was a bit poor. 
so that's just a snapshot of the sort of challenges that we find in iot devices in the wearable space which are more sophisticated than anything we find in the home space obviously let's have a look at industrial systems um, this was intended as reference for after the presentation i'm not going to give you a, a, a deep lecture on industrial computing you either probably know it already or aren't very interested one way or the other but you know this the history of any sort of uh, operational technology as we must now call it goes back decades and many of the protocols have been carried forward decade through decade and for those of you that are interested in networking these protocols get tunneled inside tcp ip typically on one portal line so there's a huge amount of backwards compatibility in the industrial automation space and there's lots of terms that people use i'm really not going to bore you with these now but if you have to quiz me on it you can. so we talked about water and sewage systems this is a simplistic diagram just to illustrate why industrial systems might be useful so you've got a pump you've got a can for the water you've got a supply and you've got flow and uh, level data and valve control all that controlled by what is functionally for, for, for sake of argument a pc at the top okay. and in industrial systems what's the cheapest simplest thing to use as a programmable logic controller these days the answer is of course windows pc because it's cheap and easy and that's why you'll find many many nice up-to-date versions of windows 95 out there controlling you know, i was going to say that they're still out there controlling systems that that are fundamentally quite important and you know if you've never looked at the security implications of running those versions of windows then don't even think about it you just get the press so it doesn't have to do a great deal it's just supplying a brain to process the data and, and run some simple boolean logic really in that example when it gets more complicated like this which is like the australian wastewater treatment thing we were talking about then you've got an awful lot of devices all talking to each other in almost an hierarchical sense there are sensors all over this system there are control valves and things that go work click and that sort of stuff um, which go back to um, a whole bunch of controllers on the top what i found interesting about this diagram which is still quite old is that even though these were designed originally to be isolated systems we're talking about twisted pair you know two wire connections through a lot of this stuff originally they were designed as, as standalone as isolated systems so the risk was deemed to be you had to be on site to get access to the stuff what's this thing here it's got a little twiddly aerial looking thing on it and that thing up there has got a twiddly looking aerial thing on it and that thing's got a twiddly looking aerial so it's got radio communication and very rapidly and many years ago it started to have internet connection and that internet connectivity includes uh, wireless of course on site and remotely silly question why would they want access to the internet the wastewater part so the question was for those of you the back silly question and it isn't it's a silly answer but the silly question is why would they want internet access the answer is that people don't like living in sewage plants so they want to work remotely um, you would hope in the good old days what would they do they would have Matthew, Matthew Broderick there with his dialer and they'd phone up and they'd have a modem connection and that was always the case when people and there are still plenty if you feel like doing some more dialing there are still plenty of industrial systems out there with modems on them oh 9600 stuff the technical description so getting into the figures now so that that's an opportunity but you know when when people in it would say why are you still using a modem why don't you use the internet they go oh okay <laughs> it's in that voice <laughs> remote diagnostics remote control remember what i said about i don't know you know if you're not a network person i might be talking to myself but it's all tunneled through one port so the data the control everything is 
in one little encapsulated TCP IP packet. So when you get that TCP packet, you take it to bits, you can, you can say, oh, OK, if I send this there, it will do that. Now, what you'd like to do is maybe only allow alarm messages to go out via the internet so the engineer at home can go <clears throat> panic, panic, and use some other out-of-band method to correct things. But that would be too difficult. Plus, you can't filter one message type from another because they're all going out on the same port, so firewall doesn't work. You have to have a special firewall that understands the protocols and goes really deep inspection, which then might go wrong. And if it goes wrong, you don't get the alerts anymore. And if you don't get the alerts anymore, maybe you have a Chernobyl. So it depends, what, not from a wastewater treatment plant, mind you. I just segue into nuclear for fun. Then. <laughs> All of this stuff right, was designed pre internet, not before the internet was available, but before it was used commercially, and still looks the same. So when you go to Siemens, the, the, the great German company, the so many clever good things, you can have something as complicated as this, and look at all the computers in it, it's very exciting, and they're all blue, it's lovely. That is a typical modern, what the press would call SCADA, system, an operational technology system. If you were to buy all of that new and install it in whatever it is your business does for a living and that needs all this stuff, it would probably be adequately secure. But the problem is that nobody can afford to do that or wants to afford to do that. These sort of installations are very expensive. The return on investment is expected to persist over 10 to 20 years. So imagine that your office network was the same office network you were using 20 years ago, and that's what you've got in a lot of industrial environments. <coughs> exactly that. Because it does the job. It doesn't have users who want point-and-click rubbish, right? They don't want colour. <laughs> they don't want all kinds of graphics on the screen. So they just want the damn thing to work. And when you're looking at process control, data acquisition, anything in industrial automation, it's fairly simplistic doesn't need a lot of processing power most of the time, so why would you spend lots of money to upgrade it? So this is just like when we would report a problem to Microsoft with Windows, and they would say, but if you had Windows 10 installed everywhere, it wouldn't be a problem anymore. It's that mindset. Yeah, that would be wonderful, no, it wouldn't. Mm. But, no, it wouldn't. I don't like Microsoft, but pretending that that would solve the problem, it's a massive leap for a business to consider doing that with all the equipment they've got rolled out, right? Imagine then multiplying that by I don't know how much. In an industrial environment, you can't keep changing everything. You don't stop it, for, for one thing. It runs 24-7. You know, confidentiality, integrity, availability is the other way up in industrial system. It's availability first. Of course it is. And, you know, if it's a nuclear reactor or a water treatment plant, you probably agree <laughs> that being able to access it and make sure it's functioning properly is very, very important. But the problem is that you, 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 it's very hard to fix it point by point, the problems they have. And at the same time, it's financially and, and practically impossible to replace it all either. So you inherit these sorts of problems. Just on authentication, this is not a made-up list, this is personal experience, and uh, CPNI and lots of other people compiled the same list, so it must be true, because that's okay, God, right? Default passwords everywhere, more so than, than, than we had in office IT 15 years ago. Very poor quality passwords, because why should we care? We're actually keeping the system running. I don't want to have to remember a complex passphrase if I need to log in to switch off the reactor. In fact, the system will even let you put in a complex passphrase. It was never designed and you haven't had the maintenance to actually increase the quality of the password. Much more valid. Absolutely true. Shared passwords. I did a piece of work, nothing to do with IoT, for a large retail client back in 2003 where they hadn't rolled out any central authentication for the router switches and firewalls. So instead you had to SSH or Telnet to every device. And the only way to make that work was every device would have the same enable password on it. And that meant that everybody in the comms department had to know what that password was. 
and it was too difficult to change it regularly. So when people left and new people started, the same password persisted. I still remember this happening when I was, anybody remember ReadyFun? Okay. Yay, see? Thank you, sir. I'll shake your hand later. I worked for ReadyFun in 1976, 77, I think. Yeah. Um, on key to disk systems that they sold amongst other places, the Narodovi Bank in Warsaw. And there was an engineering password which was hardwired into every system. I wonder if they're still running. This is a hack if they are. If they are, it would be it proves as a god, I think, because I'd be amazed if that kit's still running. But anyway, it was NFIDR, which is ready form backwards with the two out of valves removed. And every engineer knew that, and it never changed for decades. Same principle applies with many of these systems because you know if you haven't got a radius server and you probably haven't and you've got lots of different sorts of kit and you need access readily, you're going to share passwords anyway. Or there's no passwords or there's anonymous logins or there's remote access via modem and like I said, the, the replacement cycle makes your IT department look like they're changing the kit every week. Okay, this is another one where it's gone shrinky. Makes me a bit of paper there. Okay. Oh yeah, not patched or hardened. Okay, <coughs> right, right. So you're identified with this stuff, I reckon. So many systems running on unsupported operating systems. Still, you know, 95, 98, NT. Patching can break the application. Patching can violate the vendor's service contract. Systems never taken offline since downtime can cause massive problems. Systems rarely harden since it's believed probably correctly that it may impact the application. SCADA applications themselves contain vulnerabilities and frequently for the same sorts of reasons, no anti-malware. So it's a nice soft target for a classic hacker. Insecure protocols, again, I'm not going to go into field bus and stuff. And, you know, those of you who know what it is will be bored, and those of you who don't will be bored as well. But basically, none of this stuff was designed to be secure. Most field devices use proprietary IP stacks that are prone to denial of service and buffer overflows because they haven't been put through the same rigor as the commercial system might have been. Fieldbus was designed for serial comms, so no built authentication. The authentication was based on that device can see that device, therefore it is that device. When you tunnel that through TCP IP, that's no longer true, but it's still the model. Most communications in plain text. And last time I looked at industrial system, there was SNMP version one everywhere, which is a major backdoor and lots of fun for people like me that like SNMP. And no segmentation in many of these networks. I did a little trip to Belgium, might be five years ago now, invited by um, a major industrial to go and look at their IT network to see if I could see any OT equipment, any operational devices, and yes, I could. Notionally, all the operational technology was firewalled off the main green IT network. In reality, it wasn't. At least one firewall was set to any, 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 any. And in several cases, not plugged in at all, but that's bypassed. And we, we did four proofs of concept. It used to be very, very, very circumspect if you're testing industrial systems, if you don't want to end up with a very large bill and a smack around the head by someone. So we were very gentle with it, but we were able to prove that we could shut down all the radio comms the radio comms they used in their, uh, in their manufacturing environment were the same radio comms that most European cities use for their transit networks. Run off an NT server, lovely. Any blue screens recently in public? I wait, yeah. In our lifts. In your lifts, That's excellent. Scary one to get a lift and see a blue screen again. <laughs> you had it in the taxi cab? I had one stuck in a loop in a cab, you know, a cab vision. It's a, it's a special service to drive you insane when the cab driver's tired of driving you insane personally. So it puts on these adverts that you don't want to watch. Well, mine didn't. It just sat there in a Windows restart loop, which was entertaining for the first six iterations. And I put my bag in front of it. 
We had one, my favourite was at the Science Museum, and I shouldn't be nasty to them, but it was a long time ago. And basically, there was this beautiful big display screen with screen printed over the bottom of it. It said, what will the future hold? Right, so it's actually written on the screen. And then the screen would have this wonderful, exciting um, slide presentation. But it was a blue screen. And I said, yeah. That is what the future will have. So I've got, um, I'm not showing you the videos because I'm a respecter of copyright and, and they're on YouTube and I didn't want to rely on an internet connection because this is after all the BCS. And, um, sorry, BCS. I'm a fellow, I love you really. Um, but if you get the slides after, just follow the link and have a look at it. This is tremendous fun. These two guys, I mean, could he be more gay? He's just wonderful. I'll give him a job in a minute. <laughs> Love him. Um, these two guys are a, a, a Danish company, as I remember. Um, they just basically prove how easy it is to steal a Tesla. Now, as one went past me on the motorway today, I really thought, yeah. <laughs> um, you've got to watch it to, to appreciate it, but it's pretty easy because there is the option, or was when they did this last year, to have keyless start with your smartphone. So if you've left your key at home, you can start it with your smartphone. Now, this is not a cheap vehicle, right? I mean, I don't imagine, I'm not gonna buy one, I'll stick with Nasta Martin, but you know, I imagine that they're quite a lot of money. So what's funny is all they did was a standard um, evil twin attack. So basically the, the guy turns up at the petrol station, up, 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 up pops a Wi-Fi connection, with, for the burger bar next door, as I remember how it goes, and it, it basically free Wi-Fi connects to the free Wi-Fi uh, in return for this voucher for a free hamburger or something, and boff, because he's got an Android phone, he's bang 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 hacked. That malicious software on his smartphone then harvests the credentials from the Tesla app, and so this guy's walking around with his laptop. He said. In, in reality, I wouldn't be walking around with a laptop. I'd have it on a smaller device. I'd say, really? No, you're right. So he's walking around with his laptop anyway. And he just unlocks the car, a golden door opens, he gets in, clips a few more keys, engine starts up, and he drives off. And it's a lovely demo. It really doesn't matter whether it's going to happen in the world or not. It's just a great video to watch. Second one is Ken Munro. You, some of you might know Ken. He, he runs... Uh, Pentest Partners, one of our competitors, they do a lot of good stuff on IoT, so look at me promoting the competition. Um, he's got a lovely story about the eye kettle and, uh, and the coffee machine. And boiling it down, <laughs> that was my unconscious, I didn't expect to say that. You know, but still, <laughs> anyway, the bottom line is that a lot of people, you can scan for these things, right? Like you do with a scanny thing. And it's all on the internet. People buy this super duper coffee machine that's got all this Wi Fi connectivity and don't use it. So they just use it like a coffee machine manually. So it's plugged in and it's connected because it's wireless connected. And fascinatingly, everything's at default. So he said, that's a lot of trouble to go to just to annoy somebody by using all the beans up in their coffee machine and so on. But as a principal example of a hack, it's perfect. And the last example was this young man um, who did an amazing talk, and it's really worth watching. Um, he's actually, as I recall, he's Canadian, forgive me if I've got that wrong. And he, they flew him to do a presentation, he's 11, right? And this, is, this gives a lie to all those people that say kids don't know anything about computers. So all the way to the Netherlands to give this presentation, Basically, he, he scans the audience with their permission, finds a vulnerable uh, smartphone, takes control of that smartphone, uses it to record the audience member's voice and make the teddy bear play it back. Is he level? Very clear. And um, you know, give him a job, right? But then this kid teaches the audience and says, you know, what if someone uses that for grooming kids? You know, and then all the horrible thoughts start. Now, it was such a great presentation and such a, a, a great way to emphasize why these things are important. My colleague Rob did a piece of, uh, of work for Good Morning Britain, which I understand is a TV program. 
I, I, I haven't watched TV, but apparently it's very popular and has some very unpleasant man on it. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Um, but anyway, they asked him to, and it wasn't a setup, they said, come to one of our presenters' homes. We'll set up uh, an IP camera on the pretext that she was going to use it as a baby monitor. And then you see whether you can hack into it or not. You and I will be amazed to learn that the hack involved connecting to it. In other words, scan, scan, on the network, bosh, no password. And what really told me, better than anything, it's worth trying to, to, to find the clip if they've still got it on whatever their watch again system is, is that the presenter said, well, I didn't realise they were this vulnerable. I bought it from Debenham, so I thought it would be okay. <laughs> and that's not her being stupid, is it? That's what society thinks like. Bought it from a reputable store, so it must be safe. And I'll leave you on that thought and, and just invite you to consider the following. And I did write them down, so let's hope I've still got my notes. Yeah, somewhere here. There it is. One, if you're going to have IoT at home, segregate it. Go crazy and either have another router or use a DMZ function on your router, which you might already have, or if you're going to do it wireless, set up a guest network that they connect to. Please don't connect your regular stuff onto the same network. Do think about the privacy applications, implications. Do give some thought to what data might be being transmitted. You might say, I don't care, which is fine, but at least think about it. And from a work perspective, these things are all over your network already. If you look at the standard server that you buy from Dell or from HP, it comes with a backdoor built in, right, for when the operating systems crash that connects straight to the firmware. It gives itself another IP address on the same network. Most people don't think about it. Some businesses use it enthusiastically. Those that don't, don't even know it's there. And guess what? Default password. So scan your own <coughs> networks or get somebody to scan them for you and look for these devices. The smart whiteboards, the smart meeting booking stuff on the door, all the post stuff in offices that are a lot bigger than first bases, which only has 20 people in it. And, and just think about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, before we go off to uh, the food and wine outside, um, we've got a bit of time for questions. So, anyone want to kick off? Yeah. Thank you for that. That's very interesting. Um, just, you talked about segregating networks. Um, I'm not really a techie person, so. Are there any hints and tips you can give around how you do that? Because it's something that's really concerning me about TVs. And I try and put all my stuff on, on a guest wireless network, but then they can't speak to each other very well. It just goes straight out over the internet, which isn't really that useful if you want to... Well, um, the, yeah, thank you very much. It's a great question. <laughs> so my thinking about the segregation is a defence against somebody using a weak device to hop onto something that you care about. That was my reasoning behind it. So we, we, my wife and I love backup and love data security and we love business continuity because we're terribly sad nerds. So we always had two phone lines, two different ISPs, two separate routers. So our business network is utterly physically isolated from our play network. However, I appreciate most people want to, won't want to make that investment. So putting it onto a separate wireless network where the it's like a BT hub offers that by default, I believe. BT, my friends again, just like Microsoft. And um, that is great. If you can get all those devices on the, on the guest network, at least you've isolated them from attacking things you care about. It doesn't protect you at all, of course, to, about the fact that data squirting across the internet to heaven knows where in plain text. That's a different question. If you, at the moment, if you don't want that to happen, don't plug the device in. Because in that, you can do about it without taking the TV to bits. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the way it is, I'm afraid. That's the problem with embedded stuff, is what it is. Trouble at the back, please. <laughs> 
if you could do one thing on the IoT devices, Peter, what would it be? If I could do what one thing? If you could put one thing on all the IoT devices. If I could put one thing on all the IoT devices, what would it be? Padlock. <laughs> <laughs> In, in transit encryption would be my first choice because I think that's the biggest problem. I still, I, I've, I've got a meeting at, at, at airport hotel tomorrow. I won't say which one because it really would be embarrassing to Hilton if I was to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the truth? And I got, I talked to the conference organizer and said I want to book this meeting. And she said, fill this form in and send it back to me. Credit card number, expiry date, <laughs> CVV code name, address. I said, I'm really sorry, I can't send you that by email. Have you heard of PCI DSS? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll pop in and do it in person. <laughs> and you'll just print it out and keep it in full public view. No but, yeah, when people still think like that, I think, I think interception is my primary concern. But there's so many, so many things. I think a padlock's better. Anyone else? Yeah. It's just keeping you fit, girl. You can come down the back of Hi, I'm with trouble as well. Oh, and yeah. Just, and you look so nice when you came. I know. And also with the SPA uh, Software Practice Advancement Group, we just today uh, confirmed a, an event on the 2nd of August where we had the security vulnerabilities of IoT printers. Oh. And the, the CISO for Canon will be talking on vendor. So that's. Yeah, your, uh, we shared a panel together just recently. He's a okay. super guy. Lovely guy. Yeah. Yes. Lovely exactly. guy. So he'll be here on the 2nd of August and hopefully... Oh, we'll hear if you can, it, absolutely great speaker. I definitely recommend it. Well, he just, we just did it today. So. Excellent. Oh, great. You'll love it. Okay. Okay, thank you. He's a very bright guy. Any other questions? No, we're we're the board. Board. <coughs> So, um, just before we go for the food, um, I just wanted to see, mention something that, um, that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, you may have seen earlier today an email come around from John Mitchell. Oh, is that another question oh. for IoT? Please, can I ask you the question, please? Okay, I'll wish I would have let you shout, man. I'm just shouting back, right? <laughs> so, Peter, um, I see you are a CISSP. Yeah. And you, uh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Can you describe what's the value of that? If there's one. Why have I got it? Because I could. Uh, no, I, I, the value I, of I, Look, I studied for three hours for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> honestly, it's the only time I've ever done a revision in my life because I've only got two O levels and those I've got my luck. Why did I get a CISSP? Really? Because I don't have a degree. Because I, I, I don't have A levels. I'm, I'm an engineer brought up through an apprenticeship. I've got ONC, that sort of stuff. And I thought, thank you, and I thought it would be a good thing to have. And honestly, going to, I'm mentoring two people at work through at the moment in serious answer now. And I think it gives a breadth of knowledge that people in a particular silo just can't get. So it makes them think about stuff in information security. Everybody says it's three miles wide and three inches thick. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's useful. Particularly in a consultancy role, you're dealing with, with real people. You might be a specialist, but if you don't know about, you may ask speak pain news. If you don't know about the other shit, you, you, you're, you're, going to, you're going to miss out, I think. It contextualizes security for me. And they don't pay me to say that. But I keep me CPE things up. <laughs> Stuff. 20 years ago, the network essentials part of the MCSC had a similar sort of thing. It got you across a line yeah. where you were on a similar pattern. You could talk to people in a similar language. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important. I, personally, I, you know, I, I study as much of anything as I can, but I think, well, I want a different job better. So, same with, you know, the only thing I've never studied, as you can tell, is public speaking. But, <laughs> I made up as I went along and just annoyed about 50% of the audience every time. Can I just say something, and I don't mean to embarrass Peter, but I came to one of his talks about five years ago. I was redundant at the time and asked Peter about information security, and he said, get your CISSP. Took me a while, 
and I, I got a job out of it, so I have to thank Peter for that. Okay, that makes me happy. Thank you. <laughs> and I have to say, it's, it, it was top of the recruitment yeah. checklist, and, and that's critical for people that want a proper job. So I've got you to thank you. It's interesting. Oh, oh no, not in the chair. Edit, edit. I think Peter's not supposed to be so bad. So just a quick one. When we registered for this event, we were asked to throw our SARCA registration, throw our CPD, but we were not asked for our ISC squared registration. I might have given some CPD and ten You can self certify you can self certify for it. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like doing that. It's that form's great. I've filled it in so many times. <laughs> um yeah, but it isn't we actually asked to register the registration for the event. Because it's sort of partner group, yeah. um, that's why we're And I see squared up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so that's really why we're, we're asking you to sort of gauge where people are finding out about the bomb and you know, where the sort of membership lies, really, I suppose. Is it? Yeah. There's a CPE. Grab it. Yeah. <laughs> I, only get, I only get half of one for, for three other prep women. Yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah. Anyone from the front? No, they want no, mine. No, no. Okay. Um, so, um, before we say thank you again to you, just one uh, little message. Thank you, Andy, on the spot. Um, you've seen an email go out from John Mitchell um, earlier today. Fred. Fred? Fred. Yes, regarding Fred. Yes. Did you know Fred personally? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So, well, that's nice that somebody in the room does. So, um, Fred, um, his full name was Alfred J. Thomas. Um, he's recently passed away at the age of 96 years. I um, just wanted to acknowledge that here today because he was actually the first treasurer of BCS Irma Group right back in 1965 wow. through to 1994. So he really did an awful lot of work for this group and um, sort of riding on the back of that now, really. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you very much to, to him who's passed on. So, Um, so thank you very much again to Pete, and um, there's sandwiches and wine outside. They do help yourselves and hang around and uh, network with each other. Um, there will be no events in August for the summer break. We'll be back in September. Please again, please fill out your feedback forms. Do join us on LinkedIn, and uh, see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.